All right, good day to everybody. Welcome to another episode of Calmly Considered. I'm Alan Bevere. I am uh, one of your hosts for this uh, conversation uh, at Faith Seeking Understanding University. I am the self-appointed Anselm of Canterbury Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture, where all seekers are invited to ponder profound things for free. And I am, as always, pleased to be joined by my conversation partner, the unique, and he has the fingerprints to prove it, (laughs) Michael Cruz, who is the uh, Grand Puba Chair of of Economics and Public Theology at FSUU. You know, someday, Michael, when we do this, we got to have like a really professor on. Someone who's got a serious title that that's actually a real title and not one that we made up. From the Joe Schmo Endowed Chair of IIF. Joe Schmo. Well, that's the next person. I need to see who else I can who I can uh, uh, enlist in my orbit will be the Joe Schmo Chair of something. That sounds really that's good. Right. I, like that. I like that. So, okay, before we get into our subject, and our subject today, folks, is climate change, yay or nay. <laughs> and uh, before we do that, we need to talk sports as we always do. So let's talk March Madness. So the brackets are set. Michael, do you have a dog in that hunt or not? Well, of course, I'm a Big 12 fan. And yeah. two, of the, two of the top, the, of the four top seeds, two of them are, are uh, KU and Baylor from Big 12. Yeah. So as with most years, I root against everybody in the Big 12 who's playing against Kansas State. Then when we get to March Madness, I root for everybody that's in the Big 12. So I'm, I'm full you. Of, Probably right. pulling for Baylor. I think it'd be cool to see Baylor repeat. I think. That'd yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Good. That sounds good. Well, I'm a Duke guy, and I'll be rooting for the Blue Devils. Although I'm not sure they got the horses to take it through. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, you know I'll be there cheering on. You know I have to tell you just just a thought here. My wife, you know my wife, who is you know I I believe baseball is the greatest sport ever invented. Yes. And uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But my wife, who loves basketball. Baseball cap here. Yes. 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 <laughs> and my wife, who loves basketball, she said to me, we were talking last night about Duke. And she said, you know, the problem is. So one of the things that I think about Coach K is that when the one and done stuff started, Coach K just he said it's the reality. He embraced it. And so he yeah. started to say, you know, and, and because of that, he had lots of good teams. My wife said last night we were talking about this and she said, You know, the problem with that is when you get into clutch situations, uh, you don't have the experienced players. So maybe it would be better to have good players who aren't one one and done, but, you know, may have experience. And I thought, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because I think that's Duke's problem this year that they don't have. You know, and you and you saw that in the last couple of playoff games. But I thought that was interesting. You know, how do we. How do we navigate through that in the future? I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, in, in baseball and other sports too, you talk about the chemistry that develops between yeah. players is get, that it could give you just that marginal edge that pushes you beyond uh, or, or doesn't, <laughs> depending on the culture that you develop and trying to develop a culture within a year of, yeah. you know, that's part of what makes, I think, college sports so interesting because there is such a rapid turnover in and people. Yeah, um, and it is interesting to say that there you can't overestimate the importance of chemistry. And it doesn't matter yeah. about whether it's sports or people working together. Right. That doesn't matter. So so what this means is that when Jay Shire calls me the next coach of Duke, when he calls me to ask for my advice, I'm gonna hand the phone to my wife. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, I do baseball. Let's talk baseball. So so yeah. we're going to have baseball. Yes. And how, how's yeah. your Royals looking? It'll be interesting. Bobby Witt Jr. I think will be coming up this year. We've been waiting for him for a couple of years now. And uh, they have a lot of good returning players. Uh, they underperformed a little bit last year from what I expected they might do. Uh, I think, I don't know about this year, but I think the year after this year and going forward, okay. I think it's going to be a pretty potent team. They could peak earlier than than everybody expected, just like they did what was it, eight years ago, 2014? Yeah. When they, when they suddenly burst onto the scene. I, I think they're, they have the potential for doing that in the next couple of years, re, yeah. kind of regaining that, that level. So okay. we'll see. Yeah. Well, you know, for my guardians, they're guardians now, not Indians anymore. Um, and by the way, let me say, I think it was a good name change. It needed to yeah. happen. Uh, if you're not certain why uh, there's a past episode on race that we recorded, watch it. Um, 
I don't have a feel for them this year. I got to tell you. Yeah. They just don't have a feel. I, you know, they had injuries last year, particularly with pitching and it was a problem, but I just don't have a feel. So we'll just have to see how it works out. I just know that uh, I will be down at the ballpark cheering them on. You bet. Yeah. Many so times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the issue at hand, Michael, climate change. And uh, as we get into this, uh, let me, I'm going to uh, give to you my position on this. And, and then I want you to respond to that with your position mm -hmm. and then we'll have yeah. a conversation. You know, I, and, and, and the issue, by the way, climate change happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's a constant thing. It has happened throughout human history. The uh, planet at times has been warmer than it's been now, and it's been colder than it's been now. The question is, how much of this is human generated? That's what we're talking about, right? Okay, so I think that the, in by and large, the scientists are right that uh, climate change, uh, human generated climate change is happening. And I think it's a problem, but, I must confess, I'm, and it, it might be just because of my ignorance on this. And let's say, real quick, let's just say this. You and I are not scientists. Exactly. Yeah. Nor do we play one on TV. <laughs> right? Right. But we read, uh, we're interested, and so we've got some thoughts. All right, so let's go from there. I'm not sure of the long-term implications of some of this, like some people are. I'm not sure of the doomsday scenarios that uh, at sometimes we have been, uh, we've been subject to, but that may be just because I'm just not, I'm just kind of ignorant of it. All right, let me stop. What do you think? I think I'm probably in a similar position. I'll just give you just a, a brief background on, on where I came to the position that I'm, that I'm in now. And that is, I grew up, I was born in 59. So my, most of my teenage years were in the 1970s which was the oil crisis and uh, gas prices and gas lines, kind of like we're experiencing today a little bit, but worse then. Um, my dad was a research scientist. He was a professor. And it was in the midst of all of those developments around energy that he began exploring uh, the energy future for America. He was at Oak Ridge, Tennessee in the mid seventies and studying nuclear power. He ended up in the 80s, being at the uh, University of Illinois, still studying uh, coal gasification and liquefaction, uh, trying to make coal cleaner, burning uh, coal for uh, uh, consumption. And it was in the midst of that and hearing all that, hearing conversations around the dinner table and, and uh, people that he knew and so on. And just in my environment was this sort of limits to growth uh, ethos that was developing at the time. Uh, Club of Rome, the Jimmy Carter climate report in 1980 that talked about we're about to run out of everything within 20 years, that uh, we, won't have, we won't have copper, we won't have aluminum, that we're going to run out of gas and all those type of things. And so there was this incredible apocalypse and the population explosion. The population explosion was going to overwhelm us and you're going to have mass famines and starvation, all this type of stuff. But guess what? None of that happened. It didn't, it didn't happen. People adapted, people changed, and I won't go into to going all the details, but it was in the 80s, I think, that I began sort of reflecting on some of those things that I had learned in my childhood, and to some degree, it was unlearning in terms of the apocalypse and the, the, you know, the changes that were there, and so I, I would say I, I possibly overreacted in another direction, which is to say that all these claims that there are problems it's just nonsense that we can, you know, we'll solve everything, but there's no big problem. And I think some of that translated into my initial responses to climate change, that climate change just seemed like the latest iteration of all of this apocalypse. And it was very clear to me that in those, as I began to deconstruct some of those earlier learnings, that there were motivations of people for taking the, the positions they had that had nothing to do with the science underneath or the, the factuality of what was there. It was a way of promoting other agendas. And my sense was that there was that same sort of thing going with climate change. And I would still say that whether climate change is true or not, let's let's stipulate for a second, say that it is true, that there is a challenge, that we've got serious issues. There are still people who embrace the issue that climate change is a problem, not because they understand the science, because it's convenient for the agenda that, yes. that they, they want to advance. 
so those are two separate questions of, about what's there. I have come in more probably in the past decade, 15 years or so, come more convinced that the of the seriousness that there is climate change issues, that it is that there is human, uh, uh, not just human involvement, that it's it's primarily a, a human driven you know kind of uh, development. But like you, I'm skeptical of the most apocalyptic. Uh, visions of this. Um, I, I think there needs to be a more adaptive, holistic look at how we think about society and the economy. And I think that that's, that's where the bigger focus is. So I'll just, I, that, that's a long story to say that I, I find myself in ambivalence. I have a high uh, sensitivity towards people promoting or opposing climate change for things that have nothing to do with science. Yeah. Uh, so I have a high sensitivity to that. And, but I try to separate that from my perception of what are the real challenges in terms of climate. No, listen, I hear that. And I, you know, it's, it's really hard because uh, everybody wants to always assign political motives to something. So, I mean, I've, you know, and you've probably had this too, you know, I post something on this or that, and all of a sudden I get accused of being, you know, a liberal or a conservative, and I've got this agenda, and you know, I don't deny maybe I have agendas. <laughs> sure. yeah. I just yeah. want to, I just want to say, oh, you know, I'm looking at this, and and I think there's a lot of sense to this. Now, I don't know what it means uh, in reference to implications for the future, right. but I don't think it can be rejected out of hand. I think there are some things that, and I don't, by the way, uh, for a moment. Uh, deny what you just said. There's politicization. You know, listen, I can tell you, uh, those on on uh, the more conservative side who deny climate change, I mean, when they talk about the politics of getting grants at universities uh, because of, uh, you know, people, scientists who have issues, but, you know, they're not going to get grants if they say this. I mean, I get that. I understand that. That's real. I can tell story after story of people who've been very concerned about going against the establishment right because if they do they're not going to get any money i yeah i understand that yeah exactly well yeah. and i and, uh, there was one quote this is from this book uh by an environmentalist named michael holm he's quoting a guy who was uh the canada's liberal government in the 1990s and he made this statement he says no matter if the science of global warming is all phony Climate change provides the greatest opportunity to bring about justice and equality in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah. So you, 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 you've okay. got you've got those kind of and what I find with a lot of people that I when I express this concern that there are people who think that and are promoting this is a politician, not a scientist, by the way. Yeah. So I mean, no, let's stipulate that. But when I say that there there is a healthy dose of that that exists in the environmentalism movement i get pushback from people that are environmentalists oh you're just a trumper and you just don't you know oh my with, gosh you know you get all this this stuff and so it, it's there it exists but people can be um have the right perception or how i say this they can be advancing the, the truth but for the wrong reasons yeah. or for for reasons other yeah. than the truth itself yeah so, by the way last week i had this uh, encounter on social media with the same thing yeah. Uh, and just being accused of being, you know, I was trying to, you know, again, trying to, I don't know why I do this. Someday I'll learn. But trying to interject some nuance into a discussion when it comes to energy and other stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I just got accused of being an idiot and a pawn for the oil companies. And yeah, right. I've got yeah. plenty of criticism for the oil <laughs> companies, believe me. But it was just an amazing thing. So it's, it's you know, again, it just goes to the fact that we, that we seem to sadly live in an either or world. And, and you've got to be, you know, either for this or against us or whatever it is. Right. And if you, if you try to interject, because here's the thing, I think... The argument uh, that you get to the conclusion is as important. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I just think how you get there is important. I think it undermines anybody's argument to just be, um, uh, what's the word, just uh, partisan. I want to be able to say, wait a minute, yeah, I think I agree with you, but here's the problem. And the minute you do that, you're, you know, you're in. Yeah in cahoots with the other side. It's just very frustrating. Well, and I'll just 
reemphasize back in an earlier conversation we had when we were talking about immigration. Yeah. That climate change is much like the immigration issue. It's more useful as a political wedge than it is a problem to be solved. And right. That that's, and that, and that goes to my comment, my yeah. comment, I think we had in that conversation, yeah. that politicians really are not out to solve the problem. Right. They're out to gin up their base and anger them so that they go to the polls and vote so right. they can continue to be in power while the problem goes on. They don't they don't have right. a stake in solving it. So, right. Yeah. Right. OK, well, that that's another question about democracy. All right. Yeah. So let's let's get into this. So let me a couple things. Let's let's talk about climate change and what it is. So we've already said that climate change is happening and it's happened for centuries, uh, for millennia. Um, and uh, but let me this is from the NASA website. So I'm going to throw a few things at you. Uh, greenhouse gases. So if you think about a greenhouse and I'm a gardener a farmer, I love greenhouses. Greenhouses uh, harness energy, harness warmth and sunlight to keep plants warm and, and, you know, and it's a good thing. In fact, greenhouse gases are necessary, right? To some extent for us. If we don't have greenhouse gases, you're, we're not actually having this conversation. Right. So we, okay, but the problem is too much of it, right? So one of the greenhouse gases is water vapor, uh, which is a good thing, carbon dioxide, methane. The problem is not that we live in a greenhouse per se, but that it seems to be we're generating too, too much in the way of greenhouse gases, and that's not good. And I'm gonna share a screen here if I can do it correctly. Uh, for those of you who are uh, on the video cast, Michael, we just did this before I went on air. It worked. Right? <laughs> it yeah, did. well, and because you know who the guy running it is. <laughs> All right, here we go. There it is. Can you see that? Starting to, there it is, yep. Okay, so for millennia, it says atmospheric carbon dioxide had never been above this line. So. It goes back 800,000 years and people say, well, how can they measure this? Well, they know how to do this. They've got this figured out. I can't explain it, but they got it figured out. But it was never above the 300 parts per million. Okay. So starting about the 1850s, 1860s, it starts going up to now over 400 parts per million. What's interesting to me about this, Michael, mm -hmm. is that the level starts going up in co in in at the same time as we get the industrial revolution right right so yeah. how someone says that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not the 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 added carbon dioxide is not the result of human beings i'm not sure how you do that I and mean, by the way let's also say they've got precise instruments to measure this stuff mm -hmm. OK, I mean, how can you deny this when you look at this graph? What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any denying that the that uh, carbon dioxide has accelerated greatly and that it corresponds in perfectly with the Industrial Revolution. I, I just yeah. yeah, that's a given. Yeah. So we're contributing. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, so. I'm going to leave that up for a couple minutes for people yep. to see it. But yeah. So anyway, so as we as we think about this, I mean, I sometimes wonder about, uh, and and let's get into this conversation that I know is in your wheelhouse about economics and resources. Mm -hmm. So so one of the things, and I know it's politics, and I know politicians need to say it. But one of the things that bother me, whether it, you know, back during Barack Obama's administration, you know, we're addicted to oil. I don't know what the heck that means. <laughs> yes, we, we have an economy, a global economy dependent on oil. Of course we do. Right. Right. And uh, so we need to get renewables and this or that, the other. OK, fair enough. I understand that. But. How are we going to become independent of oil overnight? This is the one thing that bothers me. 
Yeah. When I hear, when I hear, I just said, look, it'd be great if we could get off fossil fuels and figure out how to harness everything, including solar. But I can't see that anytime soon, we're going to be free of fossil fuels. I mean, yeah. I don't care about the electric cars. I mean, I get the electric cars, but right. I don't see how we're going to be free of it anytime soon. So instead of, you know, again, this is the, this is the extremism on both sides instead of trying to find ways to get rid of it tomorrow, how about we work on ways to wean ourselves off of it over decades? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, let me emphasize something about your graph as well, too. I could yeah, put please. Up another, I could put up another graph for you that would show you uh, life expectancy at birth of human beings. I could show you another one that shows people that live at or, or very near or below the minimal sustainable economic existence for life. And what you would see is that the average life expectancy at birth is about 30 years until you get to the same point where your graph spikes and suddenly it goes up to 70 to 80 years. Um, I could show you that the number of people living at bare subsistence level uh, was about 80% of the world's population up until about the past 150 years. Today, it's about uh, 15%, 10%, somewhere in that range that live at that barely sustainable level. So there has been great change, positive change, positive things have happened because fossil fuels were discovered and able to power the industrial revolution that led to a great many improvements in human existence. So the two are completely connected to each other, um, the, those two things. And so when you're, uh, when we're talking about the future, simply stopping fossil fuels can't be the only consideration. We yeah. still have billions of people, a couple billion people that are by our standards, very low standards of living. And at some point we have to get humanity, all of humanity to a basic level of existence that's, that's equitable and creates flourishing around the world. Mm. And the only way that happens is that some of these other economies have to grow. And if economy grows, it has to use energy. Yeah. And so where is it gonna get the energy to come from? So we can uh, debate and talk about consumerism and you know, how we're going to do all you know, our values in terms of the things that we feed into the economy. But I think any conversation that doesn't include how do we lift the world's poor out of poverty while we're also trying to solve the, the energy and climate issues, I think is an incomplete conversation. So, boy, that's a that's a great point. How do we lift the world's poor out of poverty? I think the Bible's concerned about that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so you're just highlighting for me in in that, and I appreciate your commentary on that. But you're highlighting for me that again, we're dealing with complexities, and yeah. and uh, you, look, none of us wants. Uh, the increase of greenhouse gases that are going to create more issues. There's nobody that wants that. First of all, we have to admit it's happening. Right. But we also then have to say, okay, now how do we deal with this and what are the implications? I, you know, so, so let me tell you, uh, I listened, and this has been, gosh, this has been at least five years ago, maybe more. I listened to a podcast uh, from a scientist from MIT at the time, and I don't remember his name. But his thesis was, it wasn't very encouraging, by the way. His thesis yeah. was, human engineered climate change is happening. But in order to reverse it to what we need, it would destroy the global economy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. like, it yeah. like, okay, yeah. now right. I'm feeling really good. But anyway, yeah, right. it was an interesting point. I mean, here's a guy who clearly understands what's going on. But he says, you know, we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to reverse this in the next 10 years, whatever it is, right. without wrecking the global economy. And, the go and, and you and I know, uh, and you know better than I do, the economy is global. And so, you know, we can, we can talk about nationalism in America first and pretend and wish it was 1955 again. But right. the reality is we have a global economy. And, and by the way, we see that in Ukraine. So. Right. You know, what do we do about this, thinking about that this is a problem, but also knowing, you know, you just can't come up with solutions that fix it. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's on the flip side, following up on what I was just saying earlier, what good does it do to have the lift people out of poverty if they just get lifted out of poverty into a world that suddenly collapses ecologically because we uh, <laughs> have done you know, the work that we need to do in terms of protecting the environment? So there is, it's a circular you know, dog chasing its tail kind of thing. You, yeah. there's, no, there's no simple answer that I, that I think gets, gets us to a, a simple solution. Um, I think a lot of this stuff, and I, again, I can't emphasize this enough, neither of us are scientists, so I, I'll make statements here. I'm sure I'm not going to state everything exactly scientifically correctly or, or get it exactly right, but my, my sense of things is, from the stuff that I have read, is that often when people are presenting the most apocalyptic visions of what's going to happen with climate change, and you look at the you know, international panel on climate change reports and so on, they have various scenarios from the, from the worst, that the worst things happening to the you know, to more moderate ones, to no change, to little change at all, the ones that happen. The most extreme ones basically have us doing nothing. We're not involved in trying to engage climate. It incorporates all the worst disasters. Those are the ones that usually get pointed to as why we have to, to redesign the entire global energy grid and, and everything that's happening. And we've got to do it in 10 years. You know, um, that, That's usually what's cited. There are less apocalyptic, though problematic, scenarios that create problems in the future. And kind of going back to my thing about the limits of growth, when I was a kid in the 1970s and looking forward to 2000, where we were going to run out of everything and we didn't, people adapt, people change, uh, modest changes in directions create other and, and new developments happen, new technologies discovered, new ideas about how to do things. If you, if you look back in the 1890s, the big disaster there was how are we gonna grow cities with all of these horses and the manure and the disease and everything else that was being dropped all across the city? How could we ever possibly escape that? You know, yeah. Humanity's gonna to come to a collapse 20 years later. What do you got? You, know, you, you got cars, horses are being replaced. We don't know um, what the future holds. There's, there's an adaptiveness to humanity. And I think the worst case scenarios are not the likely case. I think they're very yes. unlikely. And so the, it seems to me that going forward that we certainly do all of the easy stuff that we can do in order to limit climate. And then as we get to the more, more and more difficult stuff, the more expensive stuff, the stuff that has a challenge on the economy, there I think it has to be weighed against things like we were talking about lifting people out of poverty um, and improving overall human well-being. And I, and I also add that if humanity if you have people that are no longer living at bare subsistence level, that they have the resources to be able to adapt, it makes climate change, the, the, the changes that will happen in the climate, it makes them less threatening because people have the greater ability to adapt to, to the changes that do occur. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's a, a very murky <laughs> roundabout way of saying, I don't think that there is a simple solution. It's a matter of thinking holistically. Yeah, it's a matter of thinking holistically, yeah. and good luck to the politicians who don't do that. Um, exactly, that's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I remember being a boy in the late sixties, early seventies. You're uh, like three or four years older than I am. But yeah. You remember the weekly readers we get in school? Yeah. Yeah, you know, boy, we're dating ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> but I can remember reading articles, and I remember this because at four years old I was a geek. I don't know what to say. But I can remember reading articles on the coming ice age. Remember that? Yeah, sure. The ice age is coming. Well, we didn't get the coming ice age. And so people will say to me, they, they, they point that out. The experts were wrong then. They're not right now. Um, but I want to say the response to that in my layman's, in my layman's terms is that, yeah, even though they were kind of wrong about that, there was something going on and they had their finger on it, even yeah. though they didn't know exactly what that meant. That right. fair? I, I think that's true. I, I mean, yeah. it, just your graph that you showed, pumping that carbon into the atmosphere, I, I think at, at, at the most extreme level, we don't know what that means. Right. We, we, good or bad, you know, you, you don't know what that means. So then scientists look at that, they see that's happening. And so they begin investigating and asking questions. I don't think that that means that, how do I say this? 
they may not be able to tell you precisely what the future is, but they know enough, they, they have enough indications to know that this can be a potential problem in a number of different ways. And in some of the ways they perceive that it could be a problem are gonna turn out not to be problems because there's going to be counteracting things that happen in the environment, the environment adjusts, people adjust. Other things are going to be worse than, than what they expected because they didn't anticipate, right. you know, so there, there's, a, there's a level of uncertainty here. And so I guess what I'd really put with the climate change thing is, is it not so much right or wrong or do this versus that, it's a risk management. Uh, question to me that we're, we're, we we know there's a risk we have a hard time putting exactly what level of risk on that and without and with because we can't put an exact level of risk it makes it hard to determine what our economic responses and our societal responses should be yeah and so let me tell you two stories in reference to what you just said the first is uh climate change on a micro level uh 35 or so years ago i was in haiti doing mission work Mm -hmm. And um, the Haitians, you know, in most of the country, because they didn't have uh, electricity and, you know, other forms of heat, would uh, build fires by cutting down trees. Right. And I can remember us going from the capital of Port-au-Prince to uh, a place up in the mountains in the northeast part of the country. We went through an area that had been completely deforested. I mean, as we as we rode on the on the as we drove on the road, right. you could look on both sides and see tree stumps everywhere. And this place that clearly had once been a lush forest almost seemed to be desert. Right. I mean, it was like they had changed the 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 area. Uh, and yeah, I've thought about that often when we talk about climate change. You just can't do stuff on the earth and not expect for a change in right. some way, correct? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and with something this big and so complex, it's hard to, to monitor what that exactly is, what right. that change, what consequences are gonna be of that, so. Right, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that, I had a second story I can't remember, but you know, yeah. I just turned 60, so hey, <laughs> you know, give me a break, everybody. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, um, yeah. And so, you know, it just seems to me that you know, we can we have an effect. I mean, I, you know, I, George Will, a uh, conservative commentator, commentator, one of my favorite commentators, he says, basically, when he talks about this stuff and he's he's a little too on the right for me on this. Yeah. But he does say and he's right. He said, look, human beings make a mess. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you keep from making a mess? Now yeah. you can reduce the mess. That's what we want to do. Right. But, you know, we live, we build houses, we chop yeah. down trees. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how right. do you keep from making a mess if you're going to be a human being right. and live in community? Well, and, and this goes to the issue that I've, I've read a number of uh, people talking about economic ethics and, and uh, mm. how, we, how we move forward. I mean, historically, economics uh, has largely been about how do we allocate the resources we have towards producing what it is that we want to produce. So what, what are you going to produce? And then the other side is how are you going to distribute the stuff once you produce it? How, how do yeah. how does that happen? So you get a lot of talk about markets and, and or not markets and how do all how does all that interact so on and so forth. But there's a ethicist uh, Daniel Finn I think is his name uh, who's written uh, several good books and I think one of the things that he is emphasizing is that becoming part of the economic calculation has also become the what, what I want to say limits the, uh, the eco ecological limits to what we do, how that impacts what's happening, that that ends up now having to be calculated in. Up until the Industrial Revolution, our human impact was always almost always very local and yeah. it had, had uh, the environment was something that was sort of a parameter that we couldn't get beyond, that we couldn't influence. And so our economic activity was always inside that impenetrable boundary that was that was there of the environment. The Industrial Revolution has changed that. And so now in our economic calculation, the impact that we have on the larger environment has to become incorporated into how we think about economic questions. So I think that that's the that's another piece of that. Yeah. 
Okay, well, we need to turn to, because you and I are followers of Jesus, we need to turn to scripture and theology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about two things, and we'll go from there. The first is, I think you and I both agree uh, that Christians have been called to be good stewards of creation. Uh, let's talk about Genesis to begin. Uh, there's a translation, Genesis, in the creation accounts where God says to Adam, fill the earth. And a lot of translations say, fill the earth and subdue it. And I have, uh, I've heard too many, sadly, uh, sermons use the word subdue it as have dominion, you know, yeah. in a negative, meaning we can do right. what we want. Right. Right. <laughs> That ain't what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, fill the earth and put your mark on it. Put your right. image on it, which, which, which right. is what it means. Put, you're in the image of God. You put your image on it. And in so, yeah. and in so doing, you Good. put God's image on it. <laughs> and God loves creation and wants creation to thrive and flourish, et cetera, et cetera. So we, as in, a, in essence, become stewards of this creation. That means we can't do with it whatever we want. Right. Right. Sure. Um, I am tempted to wax off into Western individualism and, and, and certain things I shouldn't, I guess. But, you know, it's it's can it be is it difficult for us Christians who believe Jesus is Lord and Jesus, you know, is in charge of everything? Is, is it tough for us to believe that that means that you and I, as followers of this Lord Jesus, can't do what we want? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. That, that what we have done is we become images of this. Yeah, we, we become imagers. We stamp God's image. That means That means, by the way, if it means I can do whatever I want, that at some point I'm no longer stamping God's image on it. I'm stamping my own image, my right. image of domination and control. Right. Yeah. And I, to me, as I as I look at that, as I've reflected on scripture from an economic point of view, uh, I think one, one extreme is the one that you, you're mentioning, which is the idea that we can do whatever we want with it. I think some extremes that I hear, not very often, but occasionally on, on more other aspects of the of our Christian circles, is the idea of sort of preserving creation as the way God created it and leaving it un, untouched and un, you know and pristine as God made it. And I, I think there is a sense of which God was creating and is always creating, and that yeah. to be God's image is to be creative. But it, the, the idea is the bringing the earth to its fullness is not just leaving it pristine, but it's also not abusing and destroying it. Um, so there is a sense of which the earth is both our home and the materials that are in it are something to be protected and nurtured, but they are also the, the, um, the resources through which we build and create something that is life affirming, that is, that is even better than what exists in the pristine world. So yeah. that balance, I think is a trick. That, that's interesting. Cause I can remember, uh, years ago, if I, I want to remember, I'm recalling this just off the cuff, but Pope John Paul II, issued an encyclical, and I want to say was entitled something like co-creators, hmm. in which okay. he made the case that we are creating along with God as God continues to create. We know the universe is expand, expanding. That, right. that, that is true. We know worlds are coming into existence right now, even as we speak. And, and uh, uh, so there's something about the ongoingness of creation uh, mm -hmm. that you and I get to participate in. And that means to uh, act in a way for the good of all creation and not undermine it, right? Right, yeah, right. Yeah, wow, okay. Well, so the other issue is, for me, uh, one of my complaints, and especially about mainline Protestantism, of which we are members, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm evangelicals don't care about this stuff for the most part. Uh, some of them are changing and good for them, but we mainliners, we are interested in ecology and preserving and all that stuff. We, we just lack theological reflection on this stuff. We don't talk about the connection between the cr new creation of Christ and creation itself, uh, the renewal of creation. You know, Paul says in Colossians that 
Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We talk about ecology in mainline Protestantism, just like any secularist can do, right. you know, or any atheist. And that always has bothered me that, yeah. that because, because of what's going on in Jesus, Jesus is renewing creation. And some way you and I, through the grace of God, get to participate in that. And why are we not being more Christ-like, Christological in our understanding of ecology and right. creation care? Right. Well, this goes back to earlier conversation we've had as well, too, which has been one of my lifelong frustrations in terms of economics, is that to do that, for, for theologians to do that, means that they would have to get a good, solid understanding of economics in yeah. order to understand the truth of what's happening with some of these more complex issues to do that. And yet, so few theologians that I have ever met have any real schooling in the issues of economics. And so yeah. it makes having a good, thorough, nuanced, complex discussion about some of these topics difficult. And from the flip side, e economics, economists, uh, viewing themselves as a science that can't be, um, you know, influenced by, by values and morals and that type of thing is merely supposed to be a science telling us what's happened. Yeah. There is an overreaction sometimes, I think, in our discussions, you know what, not what to do interdisciplinary discussion because they think that they can remain independent and not mm. deal with moral values. So there, there's from both sides of this equation, there is, there's a real challenge. So, isn't it? so it becomes, because how we relate to the ecology is also intertwined with economic questions in terms of how we're gonna relate economically. It makes it very hard to do a true Christian uh, view of this idea of moving from creation to new creation and what our role in that is. Um, yeah. Uh, it, so, so you and I, I mean, and I've complained to you, we've talked that I've complained yeah. that, that my, my theological tribe often gives these big overarching statements and, yeah. and which, which the statements in themselves are not wrong. Right. But then I also say, okay, now you got to put this on the ground and how does this, you know what, you know, and you know how we can solve this. You and I just need to write a series of books together. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm retiring in July. So yeah. there we go. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, that that, you know, it, it's one thing. Listen, I'm a big fan. I know you are, too. I mean, the Bible tells us to feed and take care of the poor. Right. We need to do that. But when you get on the ground, how do you do that? Right. Right. Yeah. And so that's that's the important issue. So so let's talk about that for a moment. So. Yeah. I've, I've talked about the issue of uh, Christology creation, the renewal of creation, the 50,000 foot view. Um, what advice would you give to uh, our fellow Christians listening? How can we, at least on a personal level, down on the ground, how can we contribute to this uh, care and concern over the climate? Yeah, that we're dealing with. What can we do in our own little world? Because, by yeah. the way, I think, I think Christians. I think some of this begins in our own little world. I'm not sure how else. I mean, I don't know how, how I can say to somebody else, this should happen if I'm not doing it, right? Yeah. How yeah. do we? How do we? What can I? What can I, do? Michael? I'm asking you, Michael. I do this. I know I do this to you almost every episode. Right. Michael, what can what? Can, and I say to you, Michael, I want. I, I'm concerned about the environment. I, I'm concerned about the long term yeah. implications of climate change. What can I do? Yeah, that that is a a really good question. I'll, I'll just give you an example from my my personal background of one of the reasons I find this so challenging. I went to Eastern University in the late 1980s and earned a degree in development economics, and it was uh, focused on doing development economics with the poorest people, both in the United States as well as internationally. And sort of a theme of that program was an emphasis on microeconomic development. Um, mm -hmm. I had a classmate there who was real interested in the idea of how could you help connect people who had money, who, who could make small contributions to people uh, in, in very poor countries that wanted to start businesses, how could you get money into their hands? Because often just a very small amount of money could trigger them to be able to get a business going. And, and the idea was, is if you did enough of that, you get these businesses growing, they begin to grow. And so you end up employing all these people. At that time, this is before the internet. And so making that happen was just too complex and prohibitive. 
doing that. But that student went on to be a mentor to the people who founded Kiva. Uh, if you're familiar with the Kiva organization, which is where you can get online, there's people that are looking for loans through managed microdevelopment places all around the world. And you can make a small contribution to help those people um, uh, better their lives and to, to start businesses. And it was based on this idea that if you do enough of that, you're getting economic growth and all this stuff will happen. Um, to what they ended up discovering, and what I think has become clear now in the past 10, 20 years or so, um, that making the leap from a small entrepreneurial business into a larger business where you have many employees and you're growing that requires managerial skills. And in many developing nations, what you have is a small number of elite companies that are very tied in with the government and a whole bunch of small uh, mom and pop businesses, family businesses, but not those medium-sized businesses in between where managerial skills are learned and developed. So just simply providing mom and pop operations with a little bit of money that helps jumpstart their small businesses does not generally lead to economic growth for the wow. entire economy. Wow. So I went to school on this, this idea that microeconomic development was going to change the world. And guess what? It really doesn't. It, it's, not that it, it doesn't, it's not that it isn't useful, but it is not the whiz bang, this is how we're going to solve the world's problems in right. doing that. And it turns out economies are much more complex than that. So as somebody from my background who's interested in, in how we deal with those things, I have two choices. One is I can just keep beating the dead horse and hoping that the things that I learned that I invested all my time and energy in trying to figure out how to do are somehow going to change. Or I can look at the information that's in front of me, the data that's happening, saying, okay, now I have to adapt again. And I have to learn new and different ways to, to how we can improve. And so I guess what I would say that one of the things that we have to be is lifelong learners of what is happening in the world and how it is that we can have an impact. And the people talk about, um, what's the, the term, signaling? You know, you do certain behaviors or, or say certain things because you want to, the virtue signal, that's what I'm looking for. Virtue, virtue signal. To, to be honest, they're actually, and I know what they're talking about in the most negative sense, but there is a sense in which taking daily actions, living in certain ways in our personal life is a way of communicating to those around us that we come into contact that there's another set of values that should guide. Whether my specific action on this thing really has much significant impact on anything, yeah. what it does is at least hopefully triggers other people to think more deeply about the impact that they're having in the world. So one of the things that we can first of all be doing is finding ways that we can encourage others to go more deeply into to some of these topics, to have these conversations, create spaces for them to, to do it. I could give you a, you know, a whole litany of, of things that I think you could do or might do and why this is better than that and so on and so forth. And I tell you that in five, six years now, we may discover it was just like my microeconomic development yeah. thing. I told you the wrong thing, you know, that, that that's not going to work. So yeah. I, I think rather than seeing that there are simple solutions that we can just prescribe, I think it really becomes more about developing an ethos. And I think that's your theological mm -hmm. question about mm -hmm. that's why, that's why the church is so critical in terms of creating that ethos, because without the church doing that, there's a vacuum of, of uh, how do we go about doing this? Yeah. Boy, I need to have a conversation sometime with as some as approaching retirement as a pastor. It's been 38 years. It's been great 38 years. But if I could do it again, what would I do differently? You just hit a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, by the way, I did do I did write a blog post a while ago uh, entitled something like uh, uh, is is calling out virtue signaling virtue signaling. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're about at our time, Michael, as always, this has been a helpful conversation. Um, yeah. And I also want to say that I fear, but that's OK, because I don't mind, because we're calmly considering things here. You know, right. we don't we don't we seek the truth and we, I'm not interested. And I know you're not either. I'm not interested in political agendas and posturing. I, I fear that those who uh, watch this or listen to this those who are on the partisan left will be a little disappointed and those who are on the partisan right will be a little disappointed, yeah, but that yeah. tells me we're probably where we should be. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, but anyway, anything you anything uh, you think you need to say uh, for the uh, for the good of the order before we tune out? No, I I think we've been around this topic pretty good. I I, I do yeah. think you're you're uh, we were talking earlier about theologically. I've always sort of liked the idea. It's a you know not thoroughly theologically sound, but the idea that the story of the scripture begins in a garden. The yeah. story at the end of scripture ends in a garden city. And the yes. idea is, is that city is something that humanity created and God brings in the gifts that the people have created and brings them yeah. in and incorporates that into the new creation, somehow capturing that vision that our work in this world of creating stuff that is more than what the creation that God created, but that is also life affirming to the planet and to each other yeah. is, I, I think, if we could somehow instill that ethos, eth excuse me, ethos, ethos in, in the church and thereby penetrate the world, I think that'd be the single biggest thing we could do. Yeah, yeah I, and I think you're absolutely right. And by the way, if I might add a little interim to that, that the story of the resurrection takes place in a garden as well. Yeah. So, yep. so this is all connected together. Yeah. All right, friends. Well, that is our episode for today. This is Faith Seeking Understanding. Uh, I am Alan Bevere. And a reminder that the patron saint of Faith Seeking Understanding University is Anselm of Canterbury, who said, I do not uh, understand in order to seek, but I seek in order to understand. So friends, Hope you have a great day. Michael, thank you again, as always, for a wonderful conversation. And uh, we'll ponder what we're going to do in April. We've got, there's lots of stuff out there, isn't there? Oh, there's just nothing to talk about. So. There, there is just, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's just like, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so we'll find something. We'll have conversation. But uh, anyway, hope everybody has a great day. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye. And Bye. Thank you, Michael.